This presentation in the Parkinson's Disease Foundation's eighth PD expert briefing series. Is it related to PD, runny noses, skin changes, and overlooked PD symptoms? I'm Dr. James Beck, your host for today's discussion. Today's webinar and others in our series were not created in isolation, which is why I'm very pleased to announce that this webinar has been designed in collaboration with our partners, fellow Parkinson's organizations who are members of the Alliance of Independent Regional Parkinson's Organizations, or AIRPO for short. I would also like to acknowledge our sponsors for this series, AbbVie, Acadia Pharmaceuticals, and Loonbeck. Without their generous support, these webinars would not be possible. Thank you very much. The PowerPoint slide deck that you're looking at right now can be downloaded on the viewing page. Look at the bottom left for the download slide link. You can also download a PDF file at any time during this webinar. Health professionals who are listening in can earn one free CEU through the American Society on Aging. If you registered as a health professional, if you would like a CEU, you will receive an email by the end of today with steps on how to collect your CEU. You have just 30 days until May 18th to collect the CEU, so act quickly. Now, it's my pleasure to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Lawrence Sievert, attending neurologist, Mount Sinai Beth Israel Medical Center. From 2006 to 2016, Dr. Sievert practiced clinical movement disorders and directed clinical trials in movement disorders at Mount Sinai Beth Israel Medical Center. In 2016, he moved to the CNS Clinical Development Group at Allergan, where he's involved with clinical trial design and monitoring for Parkinson's disease and other neurological disorders. He's also a native of southwestern Virginia, where I hail from, and it's my pleasure to welcome him today um, for his presentation. Dr. Siebert? Thank you very much. It's Lauren Siebert, and thank you, Dr. Beck, for the introduction, and thanks to the Parkinson's Foundation for sponsoring these. I think it's really an enormous asset to, to people in the Parkinson's community to be able to, to get this kind of information over the internet because as we all know, doctor's visits are getting shorter, opportunities for asking questions are fewer and farther in between, and we really uh, owe a big thanks to you guys for providing this, this kind of a resource. And just going on, we'll talk about some learning objectives for today. We really want to talk about aspects of Parkinson's disease that are not always things we think about, not tremor, not stiffness, not slowness, but some of the non-motor and non-traditional symptoms of Parkinson's disease and how these symptoms may vary among people with Parkinson's and how some of them may be among the most bothersome symptoms that, that people can experience. Of course, we would like to be able to, to offer some solutions, either medications or ideally non-medications to help with these symptoms, and then just uh, highlight a few recent changes in the management of some of the non-motor and non-traditional symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Now, as in much of neurology, many of the, the medications or agents that I'm going to mention will not have formal FDA indications for the symptoms or problems that they may treat. And so we have a little reminder here. We have Dolores Umbridge from, uh, from the Harry Potter world. And if you see her on a slide, this is an indication that the agents on the slide that I'm talking about are being discussed off-label. And so you should talk about these uh, with your doctor before you think about using them. And, of course, they will need to be prescribed by a doctor. So you should have a robust dialogue with your, your treating physician. Just a quick uh, little history lesson and, and a little caveat as well that I like to, to uh, sort of spring on all the residents and the, the medical students when I'm teaching them what I, I would like you to do if you're at your computer or at your smartphone is Google James Parkinson. And, of course, James Parkinson wrote the, the classic monograph in Western literature about Parkinson's disease. And if you have done that, if you have Google James Parkinson, you will see this image pop up. So who is this? This is probably a James Parkinson. It is not our James Parkinson, but it is associated with, uh, with James Parkinson all throughout Google. Um, the James Parkinson who wrote about Parkinson's disease died in 1824, and photography wasn't really established until 1826. And so unless there was a way to photograph backwards in time, this is not our James Parkinson. The point of all this is don't trust everything that you Google. Don't trust everything you hear on the street. If you hear it from the Parkinson's Disease Foundation or the National Parkinson Foundation or the Fox Foundation, it's very likely to be accurate. But any uh, kook with a c computer can put up a web page and say whatever they want. So if you hear information, make sure to confirm it with your doctor and with a reliable source. 
James Parkinson, of course, did write the, the seminal document, in, at least in Western literature. There were other people in, in non-Western cultures who described Parkinson's disease actually a long time before he did. But when he talked about Parkinson's disease, he, of course, identified the movement disorder that we know as Parkinson's disease. He identified tremor. He identified the, the incoordination or the, the hand that doesn't answer with exactness to the dictates of the will in trying to do things like button a button or pick up a small object. And then he also identified things like the, the flexion and posture and the shuffling gait that we identify as, as motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. But he was a lot better doctor and a lot better observer than just identifying motor symptoms. He also talked to his patients, spent a lot of time looking at his patients and listening to his patients, and he realized that sleep disturbances, and this is, you know, this is back in the 17 and 1800s, that sleep disturbances were a huge part of Parkinson's disease and sometimes even started before the tremor, before the walking problem. Constipation, and this is a very sort of, uh, I guess, Victorian description of, uh, of constipation, but, uh, but he realized that constipation was a major part of Parkinson's disease. And even this last quote, uh, we're not exactly sure what he's referring to uh, when he discusses people trying to divert their, their attention from unpleasant feelings in their legs, but a lot of us think he may be actually referring to restless leg syndrome, which can be a, a component of Parkinson's as well. So when we think about what is Parkinson's disease, we think about these four cardinal motor features in the center of the slide. We think about tremor, bradykinesia, which is just a fancy word for slowness, rigidity or stiffness, and a gait disorder. And among these four, there's only one, only bradykinesia, only stiffness has to be present in Parkinson's disease. If you're not slow, if you don't have bradykinesia, this is not Parkinson's disease. Some people have little or no tremor. Some people at the onset of their Parkinson's don't have much stiffness or rigidity, but everybody is slow. But this, as you can see, is far from the whole picture. In addition to these motor features, there are all the associated parts of Parkinson's that are listed on the slide. I'm not going to read through each one of them. You will be able to, as Dr. Beck said, you'll be able to download and access the slides at, at your leisure, but you can see that this is not just a simple motor disease. What's interesting about, the, about this cluster of symptoms is that if we talk to people and, and listen to people, which is what we really should be doing as, as doctors, but if we listen to our patients and ask them what bothers them the most about their illness, you can see here in the first couple years of Parkinson's what really bothers people. It's getting slower, noticing that their hand is shaking, getting stiff, pain. But these top three symptoms, these are all motor features of Parkinson's disease. What about if you wait seven or eight or nine or ten years and you ask people who have had Parkinson's disease for a number of years? What bothers them the most? Look at the top four symptoms. None of those is a motor symptom. Motor fluctuation, you know, medicine wearing on and wearing off, that bothers people the most. Mood disorders, depression and anxiety, very overrepresented in, in Parkinson's disease. And these are part of the disease. They're part of the chemical changes in Parkinson's disease. People don't get depressed because they get a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. They get depressed because the chemical changes in the brain that cause slowness and stiffness and tremor also cause depression. Drooling, sleep, and it's not until we get to number five that tremor is the first motor symptom that really bothers people in later Parkinson's disease. And so we have a big unmet need and previously unrecognized need to treat these non-motor symptoms. So how do we treat motor symptoms? This is um, something that I'm not really going to talk about today because we're talking about non-motor Parkinson's disease. This is just a list of sort of the classic medicines for, for motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, but we're going to skip on through it. Uh, we're also not going to talk about surgical treatment for Parkinson's disease. This is, uh, this is not a picture from the operating room at Mount Sinai of, of Dr. Coppell putting in deep brain stimulation. This is actually Rembrandt's The Anatomy Lesson, but it's a beautiful painting and uh, and I just wanted to put it in there as a reminder that we're not going to talk about surgical treatment of, of Parkinson's either. That's uh, for another webinar. But when we talk about treating Parkinson's and, and we talk and listen to our patients, we want to think about these things, about what symptoms are we treating. You know, in early Parkinson's, we may be treating those motor symptoms because that's what bothers people the most. In later Parkinson's, we're going to try to treat those things like motor fluctuations and drooling and depression because those are what bother people the most. When we treat a symptom, 
what side effects or what problems do we create by treating that symptom? All medicines have side effects, and we want to make sure that the side effects of the medication are not more problematic than the symptom that they're treating. How old is somebody? Which, again, bears on, on how likely they are to experience a side effect. And what other diseases do they have? People who have high blood pressure may actually benefit from some of the Parkinson's medicines that have a side effect of lowering blood pressure. Most people with Parkinson's actually have low blood pressure, and so that side effect of lowering blood pressure may be bad for them. So we have to think about what other medical problems people have, and we have to think about the goals of treatment. One of the few things I remember from my surgical rotations in medical school is the surgeons used to always say this, this little maxim, the perfect is the enemy of the good, meaning that if we always are striving to be perfect and taking more and more medicines and doing more and more things and higher and higher doses of medicines, we're going to get into trouble. We want to be very good. We want our patients to be very good. We don't want people to be perfect because nobody is perfect, and if you try to be perfect, you get into trouble. So starting with the gut, a lot of people think that Parkinson's actually does start in the gut. I'm going to show you a slide a little bit later that, that um, uh, references that as well, but when we think about Parkinson's disease, as James Parkinson himself noted, constipation is an enormous part of this, this illness, but it's not just constipation that's referenced by the colon here. We start at the very beginning of the GI tract. People can have a tremor or, or a slowness or stiffness of their jaw that makes chewing difficult. Swallowing can be a problem. Stomach emptying, delayed emptying of the stomach, not only is a problem with people feeling uncomfortable or, or not having an appetite, but if medications are sitting in the stomach and it's not emptying properly, that can actually interfere with the efficacy or effectiveness of the medication. So getting things out of the stomach and into the small intestine where they're absorbed is a major concern in Parkinson's disease. This is reflected in, in what we see in terms of uh, nutrition and body weight in Parkinson's. On this graph, you see time on the, what's called the x-axis, the horizontal uh, line down at the bottom here, and you see uh, a measure of body weight on the vertical axis or the y-axis here. And you can see at the beginning on the, the left hand, people start out at a certain weight. And even before they start to get tremor and stiffness and slowness, people's body weight very commonly drops in Parkinson's disease. And this can be as much as a 10 or 15% loss of body mass index. When people start excuse me, when people start medication, typically their, their weight perks up. They actually regain some of their appetite. Their stomach is probably emptying better, and they, they regain some body mass as well. And then as time goes by, this becomes a problem again, and people often lose weight, and, and we're trying to get people to eat very high-calorie foods to, to get them to maintain their weight. We know that the, the whole GI system, and not just the GI system, but the, the chemical system by which we absorb nutrients is a, involved in Parkinson's disease because of, uh, of some of the medications that we can use to treat Parkinson's. This little guy in the corner is a Gila monster, one of the two venomous lizards in North America, and he, uh, he eats rodents and, and other Gila monsters and things, and he bites them and injects a venom in that venom, there are lots and lots of proteins that have been studied by scientists, and one of these proteins, lo and behold, actually works on a, a chemical in the body called glucagon-like protein 1. That protein happens to be very involved in diabetes, and so this part of the Gila monster venom was synthesized, purified, and is available as a diabetes medicine called Bietta or exenatide. So why are we talking about diabetes? because it turns out that this same protein, the protein in the body called glucagon-like peptide 1, is also involved in cell survival in Parkinson's disease. And this medication, derived from this Gila monster venom and used now clinically to treat diabetes, is being tested in people with Parkinson's disease to see if we can slow down the disease. One of the exciting initiatives that, that is going on with looking at older or existing medicines to see if we can repurpose them to treat other diseases and specifically Parkinson's disease. Now, I alluded to this slide before. This is a, a picture of two luminaries in the, the sort of study of cells in Parkinson's disease. On the left, this is someone who fled the Nazis, thank goodness, in, in Europe and escaped to this country and was able to, to set up shop in Philadelphia. His name was uh, Friedrich Levy in, in Europe. He anglicized it to Fred Louis when he came to the United States. And he was the first person to describe these little black blobs 
that you see in the center of the slide that are called Lewy bodies. And these are little clumps of, of protein all stuck together in the, the brain cells, the nerve cells in the brain of people with Parkinson's disease. His uh, later counterpart over on the right is called Heiko Brock. He described how these Lewy bodies actually appear in different parts of the brain and then spread through different parts of the brain. But what's really interesting is that these Lewy bodies actually don't appear in Parkinson's in the brain initially. In many people, they actually appear first in the gut, in the nerves around the intestine. And Dr. Brock was one of the people who demonstrated this. This is why, as I mentioned before, we think that Parkinson's may actually start in the nerves that are innervating the gut and then spread up to the brain. Now, because this is, is a gut disease and may initially be a gut disease, we know that people sometimes years before they actually have tremor and stiffness and slowness start to experience significant constipation. And that constipation persists and sometimes is, is debilitating and also medically problematic. People can become actually impacted and they have to go to the emergency room to, to have stool taken out of their body uh, physically. So how do we try to treat this and, and make people's lives better with constipation? Uh, my first suggestion is not to use medication, if at all you can, but to, to try these three Ws, water, walking, and vegetables. So lots and lots of fluid, at least six to eight large glasses of water or iced tea or iced coffee, not sugary sweet juices, but some kind of liquid every day. Walking is great, other kinds of abdominal exercises, and then a diet that is high, high, high in fiber. You can supplement your fiber with this Rancho recipe, which I, I stole from Dr. Cheryl Waters at Columbia. You can see the recipe here. You mix these together, put them in the ice box, and then eat a bowl of it either hot or cold for breakfast every day with a big cup of coffee and lots of fluid, and this will ensure that you get a, a good component of dietary fiber. As you can see on the, the right here, Animals are often smarter than, than we are, and dogs know that if they're feeling a little backed up, they can go and eat a bunch of grass, get some insoluble fiber into their diet, and it will help with their constipation. Some other strategies that we often employ are listed on this slide. The probiotics and, and lactobacillus supplements are, are sometimes helpful in people. The real keys are fiber and water. Coffee is a fantastic uh, uh, tool in Parkinson's disease. Caffeine is a gut stimulant and, and often will provide that first little push in the morning to get, uh, get uh, the bowels started. Uh, I mentioned walking and also abdominal exercises. Even if you can't do a sit-up, if you can't get down on the ground and do a crunch, everybody can lie in bed and lift their legs. And anything that you feel contracting your abdominal muscles, lifting your legs in bed, sitting in a chair and turning as far as you can to the left and then to the right, Anything you feel in your stomach is going to move things through the gut. Stool softeners, things like, um, like Senna, and then other laxatives like Miralax, all of these are sorry about that. All of these are potential tools that we can use. Glycerin suppositories, and then finally down at the bottom, some prescription medications. Pyridostigmine or mestinon is something that's used to treat uh, another neurological disease called myasthenia gravis, but can, can cause some uh, increased gut motility. Lubiprostone and linaclotide are anti-constipation prescription medicines that are not approved for Parkinson's disease, but were approved for constipation in other conditions, but we sometimes do see them help. And then I think probably a last resort would be an enema. Sometimes people do just experience uh, this feeling of fullness and bloating without having frank constipation. This is because the stomach itself sometimes can be affected by Parkinson's and, and uh, not empty properly or on time as it's supposed to do. The agents that are listed here are often helpful for that. Domperidone is probably the best, but it's not available in, in the United States. It has to be imported from Canada, and it's generic now, so it will never be, then I'm going to go through clinical trials to be approved here, but it is something that's, that's commonly used. Baclofen uh, sometimes can be helpful. Axid, which is one of the, the um, antacid medicines, uh, may perhaps be helpful. You know, we have to remember that we should not use Reglan or metoclopramide. This is a medicine that can make symptoms, motor symptoms of Parkinson's much worse. And there you go. So again, thinking about this whole constellation and cluster of symptoms, what is Parkinson's disease? Parkinson's clearly involves the gut. 
It also involves people's sleep patterns. Constipation can occur years before people have tremor or stiffness or slowness in Parkinson's disease. Sleep disorders, specifically REM sleep behavior disorder, can occur many years before people have the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. REM sleep behavior disorder occurs when people are asleep in their deepest phase of sleep and are dreaming. Ordinarily, our bodies should be paralyzed. So that back in the old days when we slept in trees and we started to dream, we didn't fall out of the tree and get eaten by the saber-toothed tiger. But our body should be completely paralyzed except for breathing muscles and eye movement muscles. In people with REM sleep behavior disorder, this, this uh, sleep paralysis is lost and people can actually enact their dreams. And sometimes they actually get out of bed and do things like eat or um, drive and, and carry out complex behaviors. More than half of people with Parkinson's will report that they do have some sort of a sleep problem, and this is much more, this is about twice the, the rate of people uh, of the same age without Parkinson's disease. You can see here that people often wake up or wake up too early in Parkinson's disease, and in some of the uh, unusual or atypical Parkinsonisms, this may become even more severe. Now, REM sleep behavior disorder, just touching on it briefly again, this is when people act out their dreams and move and kick and punch during, uh, during REM or dreaming sleep. The gentleman and his wife uh, pictured in the upper left-hand corner, his name is Brian Thomas, and he had a lifetime severe uh, condition of REM sleep behavior disorder. It was successfully treated, but unfortunately he went on holidays with his wife and forgot to take his medicine. He had a uh, nightmare that he, he and his wife were being attacked by a motorcycle gang and in fighting them off and trying to choke them and, and, um, and get rid of them, he actually choked his wife and, and killed her in his sleep. And he was acquitted because of this, this very convincing sleep behavior disorder. Uh, most people, of course, don't have anything like the severity that he experienced, but it can be injurious to the bed partner if someone gets punched or kicked. It can be injurious to the person himself or herself. If you are moving around and you fall out of bed, you can hit the night table or you can break an arm or break a hip. So it is something that, that if it occurs regularly, we, we take it very seriously and try to treat it. I mentioned before it may precede other symptoms of Parkinson's disease by more than 10 years. And people who have frequent REM sleep behavior disorder at a, are at a high risk for going on to have either Parkinson's disease or a Parkinson-like disease. The medications that are listed at the bottom of this slide are things that we commonly use to treat RBD. Again, look at Ms. Umbridge here. None of these is actually approved. Clonazepam, which is clonopin, is a, is a cousin to Valium and is probably the most commonly used and most effective medicine to treat this. In some people, it does cause a sort of grogginess or hangover uh, in the morning. Melatonin is not a prescription medication. It's an over-the-counter compound and uh, you can either buy it in the pharmacy or have it compounded. Remelteon or Roserum is a synthetic form of, met of melatonin that is uh, a prescription medication. And uh, there are published uh, studies of people with REM sleep behavior disorder responding to either melatonin or, or Remelteon. Now, what about just difficulty falling asleep? People who have what's called initiation insomnia, and you here see uh, David Tennant who is uh, portraying Hamlet, uh, addressing Yorick, the sleep pertains to dream. Uh, if you are having trouble falling asleep, most of what are called hypnotics or sleeping pills are associated with an increased risk of REM sleep behavior disorder. So sleeping pills can actually make the, the REM sleep behavior disorder worse. And this is true of things like Ambien, which is Zolpidem, or Lunesta, which is Ezopiclone. It also includes the newest agent that I know about, which is called Delsomra or Suvarexant. And all of these are associated with an increased risk of, of acting out dream. Remelteon, which is the synthetic melatonin, is not, and clonazepam is also not. Now, finally, just a, a brief mention of a, a sleep disorder. Sometimes people are waking up just because their medicines are wearing off, because their, their cinemat, their levodopa, is wearing off. And when you wear off and your muscles stiffen up, people can sometimes be disturbed from sleep. So if that's the case, and, and we listen to our patients and get a good history of that being the case, then the strategy for treating that is try not to let people wear off at night, try to keep them on with some of the agents that are listed on the slide here. Of course, we want to avoid medications if we can. The first thing we always uh, tell our patients if they're having sleep difficulties is try to observe good sleep hygiene, and this is what the, the sleep doctors say as well. Try to go to bed 
and get up at the same time every day. No caffeine after supper makes sense. You don't want to be drinking coffee after supper if it keeps you awake. Alcohol is a sedative and actually puts you to sleep, but it also starts a little clock ticking, and so you may sleep for about four hours, and then that alcohol effect wears off, and it's actually a trigger for awakening. So using alcohol as a sleeping agent is not helpful. Uh, avoid phones, tablets, televisions, any kind of distraction in the bed. If you're going to watch TV or, or play on the computer, do it out in the, the living room, and then the bed should be used for sleeping and for having sex. There are actually a couple studies that people who have sex before going to bed or before going to sleep fall asleep and, and sleep more soundly. So this is a nice uh, thing we can recommend to our patients. Other kinds of exercise, like the stationary bike or, or uh, aerobic exercise, we'd like to recommend that, that people avoid those within three hours before bed because they can kind of uh, cause the body to release some alerting hormones that interfere with, with sleep. No long daytime naps. Anything longer than 30 minutes can start to eat into nighttime sleep. And actually wearing socks and keeping your feet warm can sometimes help with this as well. In spite of all these things, if people are still feeling sleepy during the day, we want to make sure that they are sleeping well at night. We want to make sure that people are exercising during the day. And then there are stimulants listed down here that we try in, um, in people who are complaining of daytime sleepiness and Parkinson's disease. My go-to here is always caffeine to start with. Even though it failed in a clinical trial, it did show improvement in motor symptoms of Parkinson's in clinical trials. And anecdotally, we have a lot of people who do find it helpful. Good old Ritalin or methylphenidate, which is a generic stimulant that's been around for years, I've found very, very helpful in, in sometimes uh, people with excessive daytime sleepiness. The last two agents, modafinil and armodafinil, I have not found helpful, but they're relatively well tolerated and can certainly be tried. I'm going to skip this slide. Hallucinations are something that, that often happen later in the course of Parkinson's disease. Visual hallucinations are the most common ones, although auditory or olfactory hallucinations can also occur. The most common things that people see are listed here, and you can see the, the statistics here. These are a relatively common problem in Parkinson's disease, and people can see all kinds of bizarre, unusual things. This is a, a painting by Salvador Dali. I don't think he had Parkinson's, but people can see very odd or um, uh, unusual things. This is part of the advertising campaign for the, the only approved agent for treating hallucinations and psychosis and Parkinson's disease. That agent is called Nuplazid or Pimavanserin. It was approved in the past couple of years for treating hallucinations and other, other um, psychotic features in, in Parkinson's disease. Before then, we tended to use things like Aricept, which is Donepazil, or Exelon, which is uh, ribostigmine. These are memory-boosting drugs, but there's some decent evidence in uh, publications that they can help suppress hallucinations. Uh, some of the traditional anti-hallucination medicines like Seroquel, which is quetiapine, or Clozaril, which is clozapine, can sometimes be very helpful, although they can have uh, sometimes significant side effects, effects on uh, blood pressure or sometimes sedation. What we really have to remember is that the, the so-called traditional anti-hallucination or anti-psychotic medications like Risperdal, Haldol, Zyprexa, uh, Abilify, uh, all of these will cause motor symptoms of Parkinson's to worsen and should not be used to treat hallucinations in Parkinson's disease. And um, going on to other psychiatric or, or mood problems in Parkinson's disease, we know that depression, as I, I mentioned before, is, is overrepresented in people with Parkinson's. This is a problem, a chemical problem in the brain. It is best treated by a psychiatrist who has experience with people with Parkinson's disease. Those psychiatrists are not always readily available. At, at Beth Israel, where I, I still go once a month, we have a great movement disorder psychiatrist, but he is one of only two in all of New York City. So um, I, I would recommend that you try to seek someone out, but if not, then, then neurologists often have to try and treat depression and Parkinson's disease. And the things that are listed on this slide, although they're not approved, actually we find sometimes useful. The, the so-called tricyclics, which are very old antidepressant agents, we often employ because there is good evidence in the literature that they work. The standard things like Prozac, Paxil, uh, Selexa, Lexapro, these are the so-called serotonin antidepressants, um, actually can work. The 
atypical or unusual or mixed antidepressants like mirtazapine, which is Remeron, or Benlafaxine, which is Efexor, uh, also can work. And then, of course, ideally, we would like people to start exercising and try non-medical means to treat their mood disorders. And there are um, actually good studies that show that people who exercise can, uh, can lessen their depression sometimes to the degree that they don't actually need to take medications for it. Anxiety is always sort of like the redheaded stepchild of, of mood disorders. It, it's traditionally received much less attention and is poorly studied compared to depression, but it can be a huge disabling disorder. It is also part of Parkinson's, and it also is a result of the chemical changes in Parkinson's disease. We know that when people's dopamine medicines like Mirapex or Cinemet wear off, they can have what's called off anxiety, which is a good piece of evidence that, that this anxiety is actually chemical in nature. If that's the case, then the strategy is try and keep people on as much as possible. The cholinesterase inhibitors like Aricept and, and Exelon that I mentioned before can be helpful for anxiety. And then the other agents for depression often will treat anxiety as well. Uh, we try to be careful with the Valium family of drugs that are called benzodiazepines used uh, with discretion and usually under the, the direction of a psychiatrist. They can be helpful, but they can have side effects such as sedation and making people feel off balance or woozy, and so we have to be very careful uh, using these agents. Um, apathy, fatigue, and sleepiness. These three symptoms can be very hard to tease apart. People who are tired are not necessarily sleepy. People may feel fatigued, they may take a nap, and they may wake up just as fatigued as they were before the nap. Apathy is very sometimes hard to describe and, and often very hard to treat. It's probably the hardest to treat of, of these three symptoms. And um, because of that, a lot of people tend not to ask about it, but we have to ask about it and we have to try to treat it. They may respond to traditional dopamine motor medicines for Parkinson's disease, like Cinemet and Mirapex and, and Apikin, but serotonin and other brain transmitters may be involved in these, these symptoms of apathy and fatigue and sleepiness. We want to make sure that people are getting good sleep at night, that they're exercising, and if possible, that they can be evaluated by a good psychiatrist to see if there is an element of depression that may be contributing to these symptoms. If that's the case, some of the so-called alerting antidepressants like venlafaxine may be helpful, and again, Ritalin or methylphenidate stimulants like that may be helpful. So what is Parkinson's disease? Again, the list goes on and on. Not just tremor, not just slowness, not just stiffness, and not just walking problems, but all the things that you see on this slide and actually more. What about sexual dysfunction? Nobody really likes to talk about this. It's embarrassing. People, if, uh, if, if men have uh, a doctor who is a woman, they may feel uncomfortable talking to her about it. Or even if the doctor is a man, they may feel uncomfortable talking to him about it. Sexual dysfunction, you know, is, is relatively common in men as all of us get older, and it is, of course, is overrepresented in people with Parkinson's disease. The phosphodiesterase inhibitors, these are the Viagra kind of drugs, do tend to work in, in many people with Parkinson's disease, and so they should be tried. They can have a side effect of lowering blood pressure, and so make sure if you're discussing one of these with your doctor that you let him or her know about your blood pressure because these can sometimes lower it and, and you can feel lightheaded or even pass out if um, you're not well hydrated and, and your blood pressure goes too low. Uh, dopaminergic medicines actually sometimes can help with libido and sexual function. Uh, for these uh, vasodilator injections and prosthetics, there are um, erection drugs that can be injected directly into the penis. Uh, there are also prosthetics that, that can be implanted surgically into the penis. For these, you really need to, to talk to a urologist. Your neurologist, your Parkinson's doctor, is not going to be able to, to uh, treat you properly with these modalities, but urologists can, and they can be very helpful in, in some situations. Apomorphine, which is a, um, a dopamine agonist that, that is used for treating off episodes in Parkinson's disease, actually has a side effect of erections and was marketed as an, an erection drug in Europe very briefly. This can be prescribed by a, neuro a neurologist, a Parkinson's disease doctor, but again, it can have some side effects of low blood pressure and sometimes uh, nausea and vomiting. So uh, again, you need to discuss it at length with your, your uh, Parkinson's doctor. Of course, there are alternatives to conventional intercourse. 
the device that's pictured here in the, the lower right is something called a hot octopus, and this is the, the website for it here. This is placed on the penis, and uh, according to their, their website, actually can provide orgasm and, and sexual satisfaction even without an erection. So this is something that people may want to try um, if erections are a problem and, and are not adequately treated by any of these, these other modalities. Uh, when my boss, uh, Susan Bressman, used to give a talk about sexual dysfunction, uh, she concentrated mostly on men, and someone stood up and said, what about sexual dysfunction in women? And Dr. Bressman said, well, women aren't supposed to have sex after 40 anyway. And, of course, that was a joke, and, of course, everybody should, should have sex after 40, but sexual dysfunction in women is classically overlooked and ignored, and, and hopefully that's getting remedied some now. Uh, we do know that dopaminergic medicines in women, just like men, can be helpful in treating sexual dysfunction in Parkinson's disease. Uh, testosterone we always think of as a male hormone, but testosterone is actually present in men and women, of course lower levels in women, but it is a hormone that's uh, involved in libido, sexual desire, and sexual function. And this is something that, again, needs to be treated not by a Parkinson's doctor, but probably by an endocrinologist or an OBGYN. But it is something that may uh, help some women with sexual uh, dysfunction. Flybanserin, or ADDI, is the so-called pink pill, the, the female Viagra. There uh, were some clinical trials that showed that this helped with a decreased libido and sexual desire in women, and it's now approved in this country. So that's something that, again, could be prescribed by a neurologist, but we'd want to discuss it with an OBGYN or an um, uh, internist as well. The Viagra kind of drugs, the PDIs, actually failed in clinical trials with women for libido and, and sexual function. And just like uh, with men, of course, there are alternatives to intercourse. I actually had a, a picture that seems to have disappeared of a, a vibrator on the, the slide here. Uh, this website is a, a website for a, a sexual uh, device company called Lilo, and they have a number of vibrators and, and other uh, sexual toys there that sometimes can be used as alternatives to intercourse. Uh, moving on to other areas that can be highly problematic in Parkinson's disease, blood pressure. We know that people, as I mentioned before, with, with Parkinson's tend to have low blood pressure, and this can sometimes drop much lower when people move from lying to sitting or sitting to standing. All of us, when we are sitting down and we stand up, our blood pressure tends to drop by somewhere between 5 and 10 millimeters of mercury. Say, you know, we're sitting down and our blood pressure is 125 over 60. We stand up and our blood pressure goes down to 110 over 55. As a reaction, our heart starts to beat faster and our blood vessels actually constrict to raise our blood pressure so that our, our blood gets flowing back to the brain and you don't get lightheaded or even pass out. In Parkinson's, this can be wildly exaggerated. So I've, I've had people who came in and had a sitting blood pressure of 150 over 90. And often if people have low blood pressure standing up, they actually have high blood pressure sitting down. So somebody is in the office and they're sitting down and their blood pressure is 150 over 90, they stand up and it goes down to 80 over 40 and they get very, very gray and pale and, and sometimes even pass out. Uh, sometimes this is actually made worse by some of the Parkinson's medicines, especially the dopamine agonists like Mirapex and Requip and, and Apican can all lower blood pressure, so we have to be careful we're not doing that. If people had a history of hypertension but then get Parkinson's disease and nobody ever thought to stop their anti-high blood pressure medicines like metoprolol or valsartan, then we may actually be making this, this worse with anti-high blood pressure medicines as well. If, we've, if we're not doing any of those, but people still have this problem called orthostatic hypotension, then one of the things that we like to recommend, of course, is, is non-medication uh, treatments. Uh, drinking fluids, especially cold fluids. Cold fluids cause your blood vessels to constrict and raise the blood pressure. Lots of salt in the diet, and this usually is not achievable just by eating salt and shaking extra salt onto your food. We think you need about three grams of salt added to the diet every day, which means usually going on Amazon or going to the pharmacy and buying salt tablets and, and taking about three grams of salt a day. This should be done in conjunction with your doctor, of course. Compression stockings, people absolutely hate to wear. They don't really work unless they extend over the, the knee into the mid-thigh, and people uh, tend to have the biggest problem with this low blood pressure in the heat of the summer. Heat makes blood pressure go down, 
and nobody wants to walk around with compression stockings going all the way up to their thighs in July and August when it's 90 degrees outside, which is when we need them most. So that's, that's a, it's a nice suggestion. I haven't had many people who actually are willing to comply with it. Caffeine is actually a great agent, once again, at meals to help prevent a blood pressure drop that often happens after a big meal, especially if you have a big meal with a lot of carbohydrates. As your body absorbs and digests those, the carbohydrates actually cause blood pressure to fall. This would be like a big plate of pasta or lots of bread or sugary drinks. Uh, some people actually use this medicine called a carbose to block some of the carbohydrates from being absorbed and prevent the blood pressure drop after a meal. But I would say just drink a, a big strong cup of coffee or a couple cups of tea. There are the prescription medicines listed here, fludrocortisone, a medicine that helps the body hang on to salt. By hanging on to salt, your body also hangs on to fluid, and that helps to stabilize the blood pressure. Midodrin, the next one, is a uh, medicine that acts directly on the blood vessels to constrict them, to make them clamp down and raise blood pressure. Androxydopa or Northera is the newest of these agents that acts in a similar way. It actually causes the blood vessels to constrict and, and drop down. The other agents listed down here are completely off-label but can be tried. The picture I put here is, is uh, Willy Wonka and the Great Glass Elevator because I had one patient uh, with this problem, with significant low blood pressure, and we, we finally got him under uh, really good control. His blood pressure was, was at the point where he could get up and walk around and, and not pass out, but he went on a trip and was in a building with a very high-speed elevator, and going up in that elevator was just enough to tip him over and lower his blood pressure, and he actually fainted in the elevator. Um, as I mentioned before, in terms of constipation and seeing those Lewy bodies, those little blobs of protein that show us that nerve cells are sick, we first saw them in the brains of people with Parkinson's disease, they were then identified in the gut, in neurons around the intestines of Parkinson's disease, and now they've also been identified in the nerves that help control blood pressure in people with Parkinson's disease. So what we're really realizing is that Parkinson's is not just a brain disease. It's a multi-organ, multi-system disease. Uh, droxydopa, I mentioned before, this is the newest agent for uh, controlling low blood pressure or neurogenic orthostatic hypotension in Parkinson's disease. Uh, you can read a little bit more about it on here. One of the things that I'd like to point out for it and for any of the medicines that we use to treat low blood pressure in Parkinson's disease is that when we give people medicine to raise their blood pressure, if the medicine works, we raise their blood pressure. And so we don't want blood pressure to be too high when people are lying down. So on this medicine or any other medicines for raising blood pressure, we have to remember to tell people that they should not lie flat at night. The head of the bed needs to be at least at 30 degrees to prevent this, this hypertension when people are lying down. Now, runny nose. Uh, that one of the symptoms mentioned in the title of the talk was rhinorrhea or runny nose, and is this a symptom of Parkinson's disease? It certainly is, and the, the studies are not terribly good about how widespread it is. But it seems to be at least a third and maybe even up to a half of people with Parkinson's disease complain about this runny nose or post-nasal drip uh, compared to maybe 10 to 15 percent of people of the same age without Parkinson's disease. In some people, it only occurs when their Cinemat or Mirapex wears off. If that's the case, then you can just try to keep people on. It is usually not an off phenomenon and does not respond to levodopa, in which case I recommend that people try just over-the-counter or prescription antihistamines like loratadine or cetirizine. Uh, sometimes those can help, but, but this can be a refractory and difficult uh, symptom to treat. What about skin changes? One of the things that we often look for in the very first visit to the, the office when we're evaluating somebody for Parkinson's disease is this sort of flaky dandruff-looking appearance between the eyebrows, what's called seborrheic dermatitis. It is one of the skin changes that, again, can happen very early in Parkinson's. Usually doesn't become too severe. It can in, in a minority of people. What we recommend is just frequent washing with soap and water and then washing the eyebrows themselves with an anti-dandruff shampoo like Head & Shoulders or the, the Neutrogena products. Uh, sweating we're going to cover in just a second. We're getting near the end here. Um, other skin changes that I'd like to point out, melanoma, the skin cancer, is a uh, potentially deadly skin cancer and is definitely 
overrepresented. There is an elevated risk of melanoma and possibly breast cancer, but definitely melanoma in people with Parkinson's disease. If you have Parkinson's disease, and we, we try to tell this at the time of diagnosis to everybody, if you have Parkinson's, you should have a skin check by a dermatologist when you get diagnosed or as soon as you can, and then as often every six months or year or two years or whatever as recommended by the dermatologist specifically to look for melanoma. So if uh, there's anyone listening who has PD, has not had a skin check, then, then please try to make an appointment in the next few weeks to, to get this skin check, and then the dermatologist will tell you how often to come back. Some of the things we actually cause in terms of Parkinson's disease, um, skin changes that are due to medications, Amantadine can cause a, a rash around the ankles that, that um, disappears with the discontinuation of the drug. is actually fairly benign, but, but not nice to look at. Swelling of the ankles due to dopamine agonists can actually cause skin breakdown and can lead to discontinuation of the agonist. It doesn't usually respond to treatment. You have to discontinue the drug. And people who inject themselves with apomorphine sometimes get little granulomas or, or lumps at the site of the injection. The manufacturer just recommends sort of massaging the area after the injection to try and prevent this. Sweating in Parkinson's disease, it's an uncommon symptom, but these drenching sweats can be highly bothersome. People soak through their clothes. We don't really understand them, except we think they are part of those, those Lewy bodies that are, are uh, in the nerves that control not just blood pressure and, and intestines, but also control sweating. You have to try and stay in a cool place, take cool showers, wear loose-fitting clothing. If um, the sweating is confined to the armpits and the palms, we can try injections of botulinum toxin. If it's all over the body, of course, that's not practical, and we just have to try some of those other strategies I mentioned here. Finally, just a couple things about balance and falls. We do not have any medicines or surgical treatments in Parkinson's disease that are proved or shown to improve balance and reduce risk of falls. But we do have very good evidence that balance-centered physical therapy and exercise can improve balance and reduces the risk of falls. And so we, we really recommend, as you've probably seen through this talk, that people have to exercise. Parkinson's um, so many areas respond to exercise, mood, balance, constipation, that it really is something you have to do. And this is just a slide to, to drive home that point. And remember that Parkinson's is not just a dopamine disease anymore, that dopamine treats the motor symptoms and some of the non-motor symptoms, but there are a bunch of other chemicals involved in Parkinson's disease that are responsible for the non-motor and non-traditional symptoms. And to treat those symptoms, we have to employ other chemical strategies. Just a quick review of our learning objectives, and then thank you very much. I'll leave you with a quote here, and then we will also have some resources after you've had time to read this slide. I'm going to go on to the resource slide at the very end. And we have time for questions now. I'm going to turn it over, I think, to Dr. Beck, who's been collecting questions, and I'm sure there are a few of them. And we can go a few minutes over time. I, I'm certainly happy to stay as, as long as we can keep the line open, but I think we have about hopefully at least 15 and maybe even a little bit uh, more time for questions. That was a fantastic uh, expert briefing, uh, Dr. Seaver. I really appreciate the detail you went into. Um, I think you covered a lot of stuff that uh, a lot of the questions are coming through um, got answered as, as part of your talk. But uh, needless to say, we have a couple, uh, which I, I think would be great to hear your thoughts on. Um, and the first of one is, again, re relating to some of these symptoms which aren't talked about a lot, and mm -hmm. you know, the loss of taste. Um, you know, smell often disappears and, and people can lose taste. Do you have any recommendations to, that people can do to make their um, food a bit more appetizing? This is someone from Minnesota had this question. No, that's a great question. And, and actually, one of the things, again, that I, I do when I'm teaching the residents or the medical students is I, I ask them from the time they get up until the time they go to bed, to keep account of how many advertisements they see on TV or the internet or buses or whatever for food uh, or food products. I mean, it is, there is a multi-billion dollar industry in this country dedicated to getting people to eat. And there is a huge amount of research and science behind it. And, and some of it we have reviewed in, in trying to realize uh, strategies or techniques to, to improve people's appetite and, and food consumption in Parkinson's disease. So about two thirds of taste comes from smell, and one of the things, of course, that, that um, happens in Parkinson's disease very early on is that most people lose most or all of their sense of smell. And if you can't smell, 
you're not going to taste, and things that you do taste taste different and abnormally. So what we recommend is, number one, you should keep a bunch of spices in your kitchen and use those on your food. You know, if you're cooking for two people or if someone is, is cooking for a partner or whatever, then uh, cook the food normally, but then the person with Parkinson's is probably going to want to put a lot of either salt, which is usually okay in Parkinson's because people tend to have low blood pressure. We don't have to be so afraid of salt. A lot of pepper and other aromatic spices, you know, curries and things that just have very, very strong, bold flavors. That's one. Number two, make the food visually appealing. So things that are brightly colored like carrots or beetroot or red cabbage or tomatoes, things that look appetizing, things that look good to eat, actually set off a trigger in our brain to, you know, start, start thinking about eating and, and uh, ingesting food. And then finally, the, one of the really interesting things in the industry, uh, the food industry, is this quality called mouthfeel. So um, things that are crunchy and kind of fun to eat, things like potato chips, carrots, popcorn, things that actually give you satisfaction when you're munching through them, these can be very helpful in getting people to, to eat. Yeah, Oreos are my weak spot uh, when you talk about you uh, crunchy foods. Um, so, you know, one of the, you know, when we talk about eating and appetites and, you know, in light of current legislation which is going on uh, throughout the United States, you, we often hear questions about marijuana. And it also, I think this is a, a, a marijuana is a drug which can impact, um, you know, people have questions, uh, someone uh, from Arizona is asking about how it might help with um, sleep. Uh, you hear about for appetites. What are your thoughts on that? Because it, I've heard it, it's a mixed uh, blessing for chance. So as of now, we don't have any data, any good data based on, on clinical trials, which is sort of our gold standard for recommending medicines, especially medicines that can have potential side effects uh, for people to use. Um, anecdotally, there are a bunch of people who say that, that Parkinson's helps, that their Parkinson's gets better with marijuana, that they either smoke it or eat it or whatever, and they sleep better, their appetite is better, their mood is better. And these may all be true. We don't have evidence yet to say that they are true. When I first started practicing, I did try in a few of my, my patients who had really severe loss of appetite and weight loss and were just kind of wasting away to nothing right, right in front of our eyes. Um, there's a drug called Marinol or Dronabinol that was approved years ago. That's a marijuana derivative that was approved for nausea and weight loss in, in people, people who are taking chemotherapy for cancer. And uh, in people with Parkinson's, not only did it not help their appetite, but it caused some severe psychiatric side effects, hallucinations, paranoid thoughts. And because of that, I, I of course, quickly dropped using it. And I would be very careful of using medical marijuana in people with Parkinson's because of the fear of the same side effects. Now, there are derivatives, other derivatives of marijuana that are coming along now. There's something called cannabidiol, cannabidiol which is the non, thought to be the non-hallucination, non-mind-altering component in, in marijuana. Marijuana, of course, is dozens and dozens and dozens of chemicals. Uh, one of them called THC or tetrahydrocannabinol is the one that is thought to be more the sort of hallucination, euphoria, feeling high component. The other one that I just mentioned, cannabidiol, has been shown in, in especially children with severe epilepsy, that it can have a beneficial effect on their seizures, on cutting seizure fre frequency. So that component seems to be pretty well tolerated. Um, as of yet, it hasn't been tested in Parkinson's disease, and so we don't know if it's going to help. What I would just say is if you decide to try it, if you're in you know, a state or a country where medical marijuana is, is available, be very sure that your doctor knows that you're trying this because he or she will, you know, they'll, they'll – um, they'll want to know it because it could interact with other medications. And, you know, there's, there's confidentiality between you and your doctor, so they're not going to report you or anything like that. But they will want to know it and want to help you monitor. And, and ideally, I would encourage people, if, if you're going to do this, you know, do it in a situation where you have a, a husband, wife, partner, child, adult child, or someone, someone who can monitor you for side effects because it is, it is not a, um, a totally benign compound. Yeah, absolutely, especially when you talk about issues regarding uh, balance and falls and hallucinations, as you pointed out, can be Correct. really um, uh, detrimental. 
So thank you. You for know, that. we may I, do this I, talk in ten years, and and there may be three studies that show it's it's fantastic for appetite or for depression or anxiety and Parkinson's disease, and we can re recommend it. But we really can't recommend things until we have good evidence that they work. Yeah, that's a very good point. So uh, some uh, questions that you brought up for this issue regarding drug interaction. Uh, a couple of people have asked. Um, you know, what uh, type of issues do you need to worry about, like with antihistamines and taking something like mitogen for orthostatic hypertension? Um, are there some of the things we've talked about here, things we need to worry about, or uh, when someone is taking some of these powerful medications regarding their blood pressure, they should really talk to their physician first before doing stuff off-label or over-the-counter? Well, number one, I think the most important thing for everybody is to make sure that your doctor knows everything you're taking. And, you know, if I had a nickel for every time somebody walked out of my office, you know, a man walked out of my office and, and just as he was leaving said, oh, by the way, could you refill my Viagra? And I look, you know, look in the computer, look on the medicine list. I'm like, you're not taking Viagra. It's not on your medicine list. He says, oh, I've been taking it for three years, but never told me about it. You have to make sure that all your doctors know about all the medicines you're taking because they, there can be significant and sometimes dangerous interactions. And this doesn't just include prescription medications, but as you alluded to, over-the-counter antihistamines, you know, herbal supplements and tonics and all these kind of things. We need to know about all of them because there are potentially serious and dangerous interactions among uh, among different medicines. The the anti Orthostasis medicines like mitodrine can have uh, potential side effects, especially if they're, they're given with something else that raises blood pressure. And on the flip side, uh, medicines like uh, dopamine agonists can have potential interactions with drugs that lower blood pressure because they cause blood pressure to get lower. So, yeah, the most important thing is just make sure all of your doctors, your neurologist, your kidney doctor, your heart doctor, your internist, that they all know, they all have a complete and updated list of all the medicines that you're taking. Excellent. So I've got a question from a clinician in California who's asking uh, about um, whether you screen for sleep apnea before you prescribe something like Ritalin. We typically don't. We try to take a sleep history uh, before, you know, at the, at the initial visit with somebody with Parkinson's disease, and then intermittently uh, when we're doing the Parkinson's disease rating scale, we ask about sleep as, as part of that scale. Um, sleep apnea is not, at least as far as we know, is not as overrepresented in Parkinson's as it is in some other conditions like obesity. Now, there is a, an atypical Parkinsonism called multiple system atrophy, or MSA, where sleep apnea and something called stridor, which is where the, the vocal folds themselves uh, come together during sleep and people hear this sort of <clears throat> high-pitched noise, and this can actually the, cause the, the vocal folds to close off altogether, and people can, can not get enough oxygen, can be fatal. So for people with multiple system atrophy, yes, we like them all to get a sleep study if possible, but for regular Parkinson's disease prior to prescribing something like uh, uh, either methylphenidate during the day, Ritalin during the day for stimulant, or clonazepam, clonopin at night, we typically don't send them for a formal sleep study. We ask about sleep habits, and ideally if they have a bed partner, ask if, you know, they've noticed anything about uh, uh, apneic pauses or, uh, or certainly about strider, but typically we don't formally make everyone like that get a sleep study. So speaking of sleep uh, and res uh, respiratory issues, so I've got a question not so much regarding sleep, but more about breathing in general. Does PD mm -hmm. cause uh, problems with breathing? Do you see hear people with shortness of breath or labored breathing as a result of their Parkinson's disease? So a lot of times people report this chest tightness or shortness of breath after they've had Parkinson's for a number of years and, and they start to have motor fluctuations. So the medicine is working fine. The Cinemet's working okay. You know, you get up, you take your pill, and, and for a couple hours the, the medicine is working. Stiffness is better, tremor is better, walking is better. And then when the medicine starts to wear off, stiffness starts to set in. And that stiffness can occur in the muscles of the chest, you know, the thorax, the, the breathing muscles, just like it can happen anywhere else. And if people experience that stiffness, a lot of people report it as shortness of breath or difficulty breathing. It, I think it's most frequently an off phenomenon in people who are turning on and then wearing off. 
And then again, the solution is to try to keep people on as much of the time, either with dopamine kind of medicines, with deep brain stimulation, with non-dopamine medicines. But most of the time, I think I've experienced it has been as an off problem when people are having these motor fluctuations. Do you see people who have, um, you know, we talked about a little bit with eyebrows and the, and the nice uh, um, trick of using um, anti-dandruff uh, shampoo for it. Uh, would the same work for people with oily scalps, oily scalp and oily hair and, and itchy scalps? I mean, is that something? Yeah, I mean, if there's, if there's a serious itchiness, then I would say talk to the dermatologist and make sure you don't have something else going on, like, you know, allergy to a shampoo or some other uh, skin disorder. But for, yeah, just for oily scalps, then we recommend people just use, a, you know, a strong shampoo, I like head and shoulders or there's a Neutrogena anti-dandruff shampoo. Just use those at least twice a day to try and clear up the oil from the scalp and the hair. Do you see any problems with people, um, question from Arizona, um, with wound healing? Um, is that something that's, you know, an issue with PD? I don't think there's much evidence that it's a direct result of Parkinson's disease, but I think it can certainly be an indirect result. We know that people who have um, skin wounds do better if the wound is getting good blood flow, getting good oxygen. And, you know, if because of your Parkinson's, you're spending a lot more time sitting than walking around or, or getting up and out and, and improving the circulation, then I think secondarily that makes a lot of sense, that you might have a, a cut that takes a lot longer to heal because you're not as active as you used to be. You're not getting up and, and perfusing the area, getting blood in and out, and helping those, those cells get all the nutrients and things that they need to heal. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I'm just going to pause real quick. I just want to alert our listeners um, and viewers that we now have a survey on the screen um, for you to take. This survey is really important for everyone to participate in because we really depend upon your feedback to help uh, gauge uh, whether the talks we're giving are appropriate, uh, something that you're interested in, and also, as we said at the beginning, um, this whole series is really um, for and by uh, people with Parkinson's. Uh, we, we listen to uh, what the needs are, and we work our best to ensure that uh, we're there to meet their needs through our um, expert briefing program. And, and Dr. Siebert certainly is doing that. And I've got a couple more questions, I think, just because we're starting to run out of time. Um, and these questions really kind of fall in the category, how do you know it's PD versus something else? So how do you know your runny nose is, is not allergies, but maybe PD runny nose or, or vice versa? Their way? It's, it's usually, I think, a diagnosis of exclusion. You know, if, if you have a runny nose that you never had before, and it coincides with the onset of your tremor and slowness and stiffness, then probably is likely to be Parkinson's disease. Of course, it could be because you moved from Maine to Georgia, and there's some tree in Georgia you're allergic to. And so if, if you have a, a symptom that is not classically associated with Parkinson's, and, and runny nose is, is certainly common, but it's not something we classically expect, then then definitely see an allergist or an ENT doctor and make sure that it's not just a, a seasonal allergy or something else. Um, but most of the time, it is eliminating other causes of the problem. Things that are super common in Parkinson's, like drooling, you know, sialuria or drooling, then we often um, don't hesitate to, to attribute that. And people with Parkinson's so commonly have problems with too much saliva, and it's fairly unusual for people to have that in other settings unless they clearly had a stroke or something that we feel confident in saying that that's part of Parkinson's disease. Things like a, a runny nose or uh, even certain skin changes, you know, have to be evaluated by an ENT or a dermatologist to make sure that they're not a primary problem instead of a secondary problem to Parkinson's. So, uh, and also, I, I think we've got another question, um, this coming from um, Louisiana. Uh, regarding the issue of night sweats and maybe um, menstrual uh, sweats. How do you differentiate those? I mean, it's, a lot of times people are older with Parkinson's disease, and is that another uh, diagnosis of exclusion? Well, again, you know, if women are going through menopause and, and they are having hot flashes and night sweats, then I would talk to your OBGYN or your endocrinologist and, and see if they think, you know, it's worth, uh, again, depends on how much it's bothering you, if you and they together think it's worth trying a medication to treat uh, uh, menopausal hot sweats or hot flashes. And if they respond, then it's probably you know, obviously part of menopause. If they don't, then it could well be part of, of Parkinson's disease. In, in people who have these drenching sweats in Parkinson's, 
it tends not to just happen at night. It, it tends to happen at other times of the day. And, of course, in, in older people, if you're having exclusively night sweats, or even in younger people, this can be a sign of an infection or a cancer or something else. And so you do want to make sure that, that if you're having night sweats that start all of a sudden, that um, your internist has ruled out other causes for those. Thank you. That's uh, very helpful. And one final question, if I may. And this is an interesting one that I saw. I hadn't seen this before. Um, is there a link between um, ophthalmology issues and Parkinson's disease, specifically glaucoma? Have you heard anything about that? So not so much glaucoma that I know about, but there are definitely changes. You know, it seems like any place we look for Parkinson's-related changes in the body, we find them. There are definitely changes in the retina, which is the, the layer of nerve cells at the back of the eye. And the, these are the cells that pick up light signals and then transmit them to the brain. It turns out that there are changes in the, the thickness of that layer. There's something called uh, OCT, which is like a, almost like a little 3D map of the, the retina. And ophthalmologists who do this can see a change in people with Parkinson's disease. It's probably the case that, that what's called contrast sensitivity, which is your ability to see different shades of gray and how well you can see those in, in bright light versus dim light, that is probably impaired in people with Parkinson's disease. And, um, and those are, are pretty well known and pretty well published on. I don't know that I've read a link between most common cause, or most common kind of glaucoma, which is primary open angle glaucoma, the sort of, you know, hypertension in the eye and then, then degeneration of some of the big fiber cells in the, the retina uh, in association with Parkinson's disease. Uh, if, if there is, I don't know about it. Okay. Well, I think that uh, says enough. Dr. Sievert, I'd really like to thank you for your time today. And no, I would also like to, yeah, it's great. We should have you uh, back for, for certain. Um, <laughs> And uh, I also want to thank um, our listeners for completing our online survey. As I mentioned, your feedback is really important for us to make certain we can improve our webinars and get you the information you need. Uh, last, I want to uh, thank, uh, again, AbV Incorporated, Acadia Pharmaceuticals, and Loonbeck. Um, without their support, we wouldn't be able to um, um, host these expert briefings. And for those who um, want to uh, listen to Dr. Sievert again, or uh, for those who may have uh, missed it, and you, uh, you know of those people, we have an archive of uh, our series um, that's on the web. And today's event will be made available on Tuesday, April 25th. And you can find it at www.pdf.org. Our next webinar is going to be coming up in June, on Tuesday, uh, June 13th, um, from 1 to 2 p.m. And it's going to be on sleep and Parkinson's disease. So we can really and delve into some of these issues. Uh, Dr. Alexander Vodanovich, uh, um, who is Assistant Professor of Neurology at Harvard and at Mass General Hospital, is going to be speaking. And I think it should be a very interesting topic. So for everyone um, out there, I wish you uh, good luck. And uh, on behalf of the Parkinson's Foundation, thank you for listening. Thank you.